I was tidying my garage out recently and I came across this little museum piece and I'm calling it museum piece because that's what Joe calls my garage. I'm a bit of an order and what you're looking at here is probably what was the world's best ever pole. Back in 1990, this was Daiwa's flagship, the Daiwa Amorphous Tournament Pole. I believe at the time, £3,750 for the 14 metre package with one top two kit. The extension ticket to 16 metres was another 450 quid, I believe. So in today's money, that's over £7,000. It's a lot of money. Was it as good as we remember? Let's find out. So back at the time, this was a real luxury for me. In fact, I'd probably go as far as to say I shouldn't really have bought it because the kits were expensive, spares were expensive, and it was a stretch, but it was something I really desired. I was quite young at the time, uh, probably early 20s, and I remember I was 18 when this was launched, and I think I was probably 24 when I bought this. This was a brand new but used um, unwanted gift, as I remember. I bought it off a lady that, not sure if she told her husband she'd sold it, but she sold it to me anyway. And it kind of is a little bit nostalgic to me. I suppose I've got a bit of a sweet spot for it. What I'd love to know is, everybody's got their own little bit of kit. Is yours a Normark rod? Is it that old Mitchell match? Is it an Abu Garcia close face reel? We've all got one. Tell us what you love. So like a lot of other things in the world, a lot's changed. And the first thing that I noticed, this is my current 14 and a half meter section off the pole that I use today. And inside it is this lovely little slim piece of carbon, which is the 14 meter section of the amorphous. Look how slim that is. It's absolutely incredible. And that was how poles were. And I'm not sure if that's because that's how the technology was and therefore it lent itself to slimmer poles. But as poles became stiffer and the desire for stiffer poles, the poles got fatter. And today, I mean, I've got big hands, but look at that. But the beauty of this absolute gem is that at 14 and a half metres, I can actually wrap my hands right the way around the pole. Look at it. So if you're the kind of guy that likes a slim pole, this would have been perfect. This here is, let me get this right, 12 and a half metres. Look how thin that is. Unbelievable. So. That's the first thing I noticed. And when you start looking further up the pole, you'll see that the kits are even slimmer. So up at the business end, this is what used to come with the pole. Sorry, that's a lie. This was a spare top kit that you could buy for the pole. And it came as, I think this is a 4.2. I'm just reading the graphics. I mean, look at all them graphics on there. And somebody must have swallowed a dictionary when they actually uh, started to develop this pole and put it to the market because it's a Daiwa Amorphous Whisker Tournament Special. I think they only put them words on because they ran out of carbon to write it on. But really, really slim. Short sections as well. Um, that's the first thing I've noticed. That's the number four. I mean, that's nearly as tall as me. And then basically what you had was take apart as you still do. But look at that, it's like a pencil. That's the number two. And the number two because back in the day, you actually had all your kits came with the number one section, which was telescopic. I've got elastic running through the top of that uh, kit in that top two. And as I was telling my learning friend here, Joe, we used to actually elasticate just the number one piece, which was at times 18 inches of elastic. But I don't really think cart were invented back then. And we didn't need all that elastic. We didn't need puller kits, which of course, this doesn't have a puller kit. There's no side puller bush or any puller bung out, hanging out of it. But what we did have stuck in the ends was, look at that, that's a nose cone. That's a Press Innovations nose cone, which is glued in there to save your joints and make alignment a lot easier. Little things like that. That's, this is when I, I actually believe that the big advancements came in fishing tackle because pole fishing was still new. People were learning how to use it. People were learning how to make them. And people were learning about what you needed to assist you to make these products work better for you. And one little thing I clocked last night when I actually, uh, I actually put some elastic in this. I've just put some of our four to six in there. And for a little retro um, bit of nostalgia, I've put on one of our elastic connectors. I think people call these Stone Force. They're not Stone Force, because that's a, that's a tackle brand. These are elastic connectors, which is a little plastic connector on the end, which was 
the way that we all used it. Some people still like them. They like the security of it. Anyway, what I'm going to tell you is that on the end of here is an external PTFE, a specially designed one by David Preston, who was a genius back then. This is a slim slip PTFE, and the reason for that was PTFEs were quite bulky. And when you wanted to take your number one out, because you had to do, because to change the elastic, we'd been in, in just in the top section, the PTFE wouldn't go back through the number two. So we made a series of slim PTFE bushes. It was a great time for fishing, a great time for fishing tackle. And a lot of the products that you have today, which are obviously brilliant, came from these uh, advancements that we were learning you know, from scratch. It's great to remember it all. So that's enough about what we've actually uh, found in the garage. Let's take this Daiwa relic out for a spin. We're down at Rycroft Fisheries near Derby and I've put some fresh elastic in a couple of top kits. I've picked myself two nice little swims, one at allegedly 12 and a half metres because I seem to remember all poles were a little bit synonymous with being short, but of course the shorter they were, the stiffer they were. So I've knocked the butt section off this and it's got a full top kit in with a number one in, because I've only got the 46 elastic in this one, so don't need a big, heavy, thick top kit. And then I've got a shorter line at the top four kit plus two sections, and I'm just gonna leap loose feed some casters on that, because I know for a fact that I was talking to Swinno yesterday, Wayne Swinsco, and he told me that there's some bream and some big perch short here. And, um, I've opted for pellets long because there's some skimmers and bream and I know there's a lot of roach so by feeding pellets hopefully I'm deterring the roach and targeting the skimmers and I'll be straight with you my first impressions is it feels really weird in your hands it's the diameter that threw me because you kind of that used to you put your top kit on you start shipping out and the thickness and the taper of a, of a modern pole that like a bite um, the thickness and the taper of a modern pole is a massive contrast to this. I mean, look at it, you can probably see it as I'm shipping it in and out. It's almost parallel. It really, really feels like it's never going to thicken up. So when you're shipping out, you're kind of expecting the pole to change in hands and it doesn't. And I suppose that was, at the time, how it was and um, I know for a fact that this particular pole was made with high-end carbon because the price was so I mean there were other models in the Daiwa catalog back then I think um, Aria, Aria High Performance I think it was the Aria tournament that preceded this pole um, but this was the flagship as I said so I suppose the carbon the quality of the, of the actual material allowed it to be slim but also strong and that's probably the second thing that I noticed when I was putting it together the actual thickness of the, the walls on this well it's incredible I've just noticed there's some worn out graphics here as well they obviously had a field there when they wanted to write amorphous tournament special whisker dot com all over it but I, I suppose they were proud of it because it is a thing of beauty you can see all the coloured graphics all the way up the pole, denoting each section. No, uh, no expense spared. And I'm going to say, this early on in the session, it feels tremendous. And it's bringing back a few memories. I think the last fish I caught on it were a car patch. I used to use this pole when I went on a few festivals in Cyprus and things like that, because I think I'd moved on to a more modern pole. Um, by then, I think I was using a Maver, a B41, it probably was, um, when Barnsley was sponsored by Maver. But before that, this was my top end pole. I think my pole previous to this was a TriCast Aristocrat. And I mean, Maver, TriCast, Daiwa um, have all been household names when it came to manufacturing poles. Uh, back then, Browning were a massive player in the market. I think they were. I had a spiral titanium pole around that time. 
when I first joined Barnes, I think Alan Scott told me using the green titanium because that was stiffer than the red one. But as I mentioned earlier, that was a time when technology was leaping forward uh, at great speed. Uh, new materials, new processes. I mean, the old browning poles, which were spiral, as the name suggested, had a, an overhead, they had the carbon, and then to strengthen them, they had a weave on that. I mean, sometimes people used to claim um, Kevlar weave and all this carry on, and, and I'm not an expert in carbon technology, but I'm sure that some of the processes that created these products were just almost space age. And um, I think my tricast pole had a, a weave across it. My, my, my um, aristocrat, that were a foul up skimmer, that one. Come on. Well, at least we know there's some fish settled onto his bait. So we'll get some elastic stretch and see how it performs with a fish on. I think this could be a bream. And one of the first things I've noticed is that the pole's actually got a bit of action. Because of course, in a bid to keep poles stiff for modern fishing techniques, we've kind of lost the action, you know, the feeling in them. Because they're crisp, so when you strike and they don't bounce and flop and wobble and all the rest of it, but I have to say, the sensation of actually feeling the pole bend and that slim top kit actually working really takes me back to when old poles were like this, and obviously this is my old pole, um, and you could feel fish like that through the pole itself. I think that's something that's just come straight back to me. It's like incredible. Stiff poles today, you can see the elastic, you can't feel the fish. I felt every moment of that. What a little beauty. We've been fishing comfortably at 12 and a half metres and yeah, of course, it's not as stiff as the pole that's in my bag that I'll probably be using at the weekend. But it's surprisingly comfortable and yes, there's some sag, but it's surprisingly responsive, and I think that's because of the quality of the carbon that, that this particular model were made from. So that's 14 and a half metres. You can see I'm going onto the colour butt now. And then, just for a bit of old time's sake, and I know that I used to fish this on places like the New Junction Canal, Staney Canal, that is at 16 metres. I don't know what it looks like from behind, it feels really comfortable because of the diameter and fairly responsive. It doesn't compare, obviously. It just doesn't compare to the current, um, you know, specification and performance of today's market. But there you go. If you want to know what it looked like at 16 meters, that's it. You don't need a postcard to tell you you're gonna get a bite, but you will need to be prepared for it because you will need to strike. And that feels like another skimmer. Great action. Absolutely loving it. The slimness of it. It's as much a pleasure today as it was then. Which kind of takes me back to then. We've already touched on the fact that this pole was really expensive. And we spoke to Daiwa. And I think the last time they listed this pole in the catalogue was 1997. I remember seeing it for the first time in 1990. I was 18. I think my first pint cost me 92p. This pole, list price, £3,700. Still catches fish, obviously. Extension was extra, and you only got one telescopic top two in that. Joe did a little sum, and basically that equates to over £7,000 today. So the question is, is fishing tackle more expensive these days than it ever has been? I've heard that said. Comparatively, 92 pence for a pint of beer. 
So the average price is four or five quid these days. Let's call it four quid because we don't want to. Because I'm sure somebody goes in Frickley Club and it's only still two pound eighty in there. But if you live in London, it's six quid. So we'll call it four quid. So four times the value. This was three seven. Poles aren't twelve grand, are they? So you tell me, is it more expensive or not? 